Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup. This for the week of the 22nd to 28th of March, 2021. Before getting started, I'd like to send a special thanks to our good friends at GoTaikonauts and Spacewatch.Global, two excellent sources for space industry news. This week, we will bring you updates on uh, Xingyun Constellation from Kasich, uh, a couple of fast, uh, sort of fast flash news updates, including uh, some information on Da Xing and the Haisa 1 SAR Earth Observation Satellite. But first, some pretty, uh, pretty interesting news from CGSTL, also known as Charming Globe. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome you aboard the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Thank you. So our first piece of news this week is, uh, as mentioned by Blaine from CGSTL, also known as Charming Globe or Changguang Satellite. So CGSTL, just as a quick reminder, is China's leading commercial Earth observation company, uh, which operates the Jilin-1 satellite. And so they announced in the past week that they would be completing their 138 satellite constellation Jilin-1 by the end of the 14th five-year plan. And so that's basically between this year and um, 2025. And this is in the context of the recent closing of the two sessions uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it's something we mentioned in the past uh, Dongfang Hour episodes, which is this annual um, session that we have in Beijing, which brings together a lot of uh, the main um, business stakeholders and also government uh, officials together to review um, past and future government policies. And this is a great place to learn a lot about um, typically this, the space roadmap. And so CGSTL announced also that they would want to reach um, 60 satellites in orbit by the end of the year. And so currently they're at 25 Jilin-1 satellites in orbit. So that's a, that's a significant um, launch effort that's literally doubling, um, actually more than that, the number of satellites in orbit. But it's not necessarily surprising when you look at, um, for example, the amount of uh, funding that uh, CGSTL has raised uh, last year. I think it was 2.46 million, a billion, sorry, RMB. That's, that's probably approximately 300 million uh, US dollars. And uh, from a technology standpoint, also, they are fairly advanced. Um, we see that they have now an entire family of um, satellites that are ready to be sent um, into orbit. We've seen that they've sent in the past satellites that are below 100 kilograms, but they also have the uh, capability of building satellites like um, like what was called the KF-01 or the Hongqi, which was sent into space in January last year, and which was a satellite that was 1.25 tons, and so and which was a, a very high resolution um, optical satellite. And so um, they have the money, they seem to have the technology as well, and um, they are entering a phase which they call, you know, batch production, batch deployment. And this is something that we saw in an interview uh, from Changwong Satellite uh, around September last year. So um, definitely uh, a very interesting company to follow. And I think that they will also represent increasing competition for um, you know, Earth observation constellation companies uh, around the globe. Uh, and this is something that we discussed a little bit in the upcoming episode eight of uh, Dongfang Hour with the Secure World Foundation and the Kalis Foundation. Definitely um, the geospatial uh, vertical is one of the um, one of the industry verticals where there is uh, more competition between Chinese and, and international players. For sure. And I think that's, um, to a certain extent, something that we've heard in the sense that, uh, you know, as we've talked about before in China, um, you know, you have the three kind of main types of constellations. You have Earth observations, SatNav, and telecommunications. And of those three, uh, two are quite sort of government dominated in the sense that uh, China, obviously Beidou is a government program. And uh, China's telecommunications industry, of course, is, is rather sensitive. Uh, and so you have this uh, perception um, largely correctly, I think, by Earth observation companies that, that theirs is a relatively more open vertical. So um, definitely uh, a, a company to keep an eye on is, is CGSTL. Uh, now, I'm going to speculate a little bit here, and I would uh, start by saying, you know, CGSTL is a company that I don't know 
uh, so, so well in the sense that I've never been able to go to their headquarters in, uh, in Changchun. Uh, but over the years, I've had perhaps a dozen interactions with the company, uh, both at trade shows and also um, over you know, phone calls or, or Zoom meetings. And, and I've always found that they're just a, a very um, professional company that has just really interesting people that, are, that are, know what they're doing that, that work for them. Um, and, and my feeling, I think, more generally is that uh, they are in a very unique position in, in the Chinese space sector in the sense that uh, CGSTL, they're a company that has spun out from the CAS in a rather more open and competitive sector, so Earth observation, as we mentioned. Um, and they're in a region that that really badly wants high tech jobs, uh, which is to say, you know, they're in the the northeast of China, so China's Dongbei region, which is considered the country's kind of rust belt, uh, having been industrialized in the late 1800s and early 1900s and, and in the mid 1900s. Um, and then being sort of the original industrial heartland under the PRC. And uh, this has since, uh, the region has since seen a, a decline in the, the level of an industrialization. And so again, you have uh, local and provincial governments that are really trying to attract high tech jobs. And so when you look at CGSTL, they're a, a spinoff from the CAS in a very competitive commercialized in, uh, as part of the industry. And they're in a region that offers quite a lot of support uh, for their their type of, of business. And if you're interested in a bit more of a deep dive on, on China's Dongbei uh, region, there's a, an issue uh, number 30 of Go Taikonauts, which has a, a deep dive that I had written on, on the city of Harbin. So uh, not necessarily related to CGSTL, but a, a good uh, perspective on, on this region of China. Uh, now, getting back to CGSTL, um, again, having never been to Changchun, I think it's safe to assume that the quality of life there is quite high for people who are earning, let's say, CGSTL level salaries. And so this is to say, um, you know, things like real estate is considerably cheaper than places like Beijing or Shenzhen. And the um, the relatively planned nature of the city of Changchun, the fact that the, the climate uh, is, is relatively nice, apart from the winters are, are quite cold. Um, but uh, in, in general, I think we, we can assume that the, the employees at CGSTL have a quite okay life in, uh, in Changchun, uh, especially compared to the, the pressures of places like Beijing or, or Shenzhen. Um, and so again, uh, when we think about this, it, it's, um, it's an interesting position. And, and kind of the, the cherry on top of all of this is that there are a few dozen CGSTL employees that are said to have some small ownership in the company, which creates this real alignment of incentives, where you have some of the early employees that really have a seat at the proverbial table, um, and, and you could argue, I think, that the, the massive state resources that have been given to, to CGSTL, and this assumes uh, a fair amount of, of sort of seed technology from the CAS and, and contributions from, from a handful of state funds in their recent funding round, um, we, we've seen this, um, we've seen a, a lot of state support. And, and so just to kind of wrap all this together, um, we have a mix of, of commercial incentives, which is to say, um, again, the the early employees own some stake in the company, and it's a very open part of the space sector in China, in addition to a lot of government support, and they are living in an environment that is, uh, let's say, significantly lower stress than a Beijing or a Shenzhen. And so I think this really, I, I presume it leads to um, relatively lower stress workplaces and relatively more innovation. I mean, I, I just, I can imagine working for a space startup in Beijing, you're looking at maybe a two hour commute every day to work on the subway and you're, you're you know, you're really under a lot of pressure from, from price, you know, cost of everything. And, and I think when we look at, at Changchun um, and, and we look at the sort of the environment that the CGSTL is in, um, I, again, I, I think that they're in a very um, interesting position as it relates to incentives and as it relates to getting state support and as it relates to the the part of the space industry that they're focusing on. And uh, again, a little bit of speculation, but I, I think it's safe to say that we're going to continue to see impressive things coming out of Changchun because of uh, these different factors that, that I've just mentioned. Um, and I guess one, one last point, a little bit more specifically on, on the sort of ambition of CGSTL's plans in 2021. Uh, so as John mentioned, they plan to launch, or they plan to have 60 satellites in orbit by the end of this year, which is to say 35 more than where they are now. Um, but I would point out that in September of last year, they were able to launch nine satellites on a single long March 11. And uh, you know, if we assume that this level of batch manufacturing and this level of, of multiple satellites on, on a rocket can, can be uh, duplicated. We're looking at you know four more such launches, basically, which gets them 36 more satellites, and that, that puts them over over the 60 satellite mark. So again, it's um, 
definitely very ambitious, definitely going to be something to, to watch moving forward. Um, but I think if there's any Earth observation satellite uh, company in, in China that has a chance of doing this, it, it would certainly be CGSTL um, for, for the reasons that we just discussed. Um, John, anything else from your side on, on CGSTL? I'm all good. Okay, so moving on to a discussion on, uh, on Xingyun, the, the, uh, the narrowband satellite constellation project being spearheaded by Kasik. So we saw a media report originally appearing in China Space News, or Zhongguo Hang Tianbao, about uh, Kasich's narrowband project, uh, Xingyun. And the article focused on quality control, but also revealed some interesting insights on the company and on the philosophy of, of Xingyun and on commercial space more generally in China. Uh, so the article spoke with uh, Xiang Bin, who's the, the deputy general manager of Xingyun Company, and who I've, I'd never seen that surname Xiang before. I don't know if, if Jean, if you, you've seen that, but uh, as far as I know, that is not a very common surname. Um, but uh, Mr. Xiang, he, uh, he discussed sort of the idea of uh, standardization of the Xingyun satellite platform and the quality considerations that are being made uh, with the standardization. And so in particular, he noted that um, for commercial space, uh, in, in, a, in a certain sense, the quality requirements can be higher, or at least the requirements for the company to look at quality can be higher. And this is because um, commercial space moves very fast in China. And so you have a situation where um, in the traditional space sector, that there's less need to move very fast. You can you know, take more methodological steps. You can take a bit more time. Uh, whereas in commercial space, you're... Um, maybe leapfrogging some steps in the development process. And again, that requires just a lot more attention to detail at each step in, in the development process, uh, a lot more you know, requirements for, for quality, as it were. Um, another point that, that was mentioned is that Xingyun and, and sort of Kasich's satellite manufacturing efforts more generally, um, they're aiming to reduce costs in a couple of different ways. Uh, and so the main one that the article discussed was design costs. And this was another interesting highlight of the difference between China's commercial space sector and the traditional space sector. Um, so Mr. Xiang once again mentioned that in traditional space, you have a lot of effort to design something to a specific standard. And in some instances, that can lead to uh, either over design or it can lead to just um, uh, spending inefficiently in order to reach that specific requirement that is needed. And on the other hand, in commercial space, they're basically designing from scratch. So they're not necessarily trying to reach a certain uh, preset requirement. They're basically saying, what is the sort of uh, the bare minimum that we need in order to, um, to get where we need to go, I suppose, for lack of a better term. And, and so this is, uh, according to Mr. Xiang, this has allowed them to, um, to save on, on design costs, which is the major element of, of savings here. Um, one other point that I would mention before turning it back over to Jean, um, Mr. Xiang mentioned that cooperation in the commerce, commercial space sector can be more difficult than in the traditional space sector. And uh, it was it, it was a kind of um, a sort of backhanded compliment, I guess, to the traditional space sector in the sense that he mentioned in commercial space, um, you never really know if the customer is going to be able to pay and the sort of unclear financial considerations um, and, and that in traditional space, I guess, uh, you're never really worried about them being able to pay. And so I think that was, um, yeah, that was, I, I, I didn't necessarily expect to see that. So uh, yeah, Jean, anything from your side on this uh, Xingyun update? Yeah, I think you summed it up quite well. What I, maybe I would add is when I read this article, really the thing that struck me is how, um, how, how difficult a game a lot of commercial companies are playing in the sense that they, um, well, they have this necessity to bring costs down, and this is usually done by, um, you know, bring the cost down um, uh, with considerations regarding design and production, and uh, doing all of that in less of a traditional manner, um, and you know, maybe having less uh, restrictive space um, space grade certifications. But at the same time, they have to make sure that they maintain some high quality and um, reliability standards. So. Uh, it's definitely a very hard balance to find between the two, and I think that is really something that um, that's encompassed in them in this uh, in this article. So, um, yeah, that's that's 
my 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 takeaway here. And and moving on to our next piece of news this week, um, we saw from the Beijing municipality this week uh, that their aerospace department uh, director Ai Bin visited the district of Daxing, which is the most southern district in Beijing, and he confirmed that the Beijing uh, government had plans to build an aerospace base in Daxing district. And so what basically this means is that um, an aerospace base basically is. Uh, that the Beijing uh, municipality plans to um, locate a lot of startups uh, in one given area, provide facilities, potentially funding, as well as uh, probably incubation services. And this is a mechanism that we've seen um, quite often in China as a mechanism to support uh, local companies and foster innovation and foster collaboration between the companies. And so um, Daxing, just just an interesting note, is one of the mo- more rural and lesser developed districts in in Beijing. It's um, but it, it has received a lot of attention in recent years. Typically, the the uh, huge Beijing International Airport uh, was built a year and a half ago now um, in, in Daxing District. It's also received a lot of investment regarding uh, transportation infrastructure, such as a rapid subway system, as well as a high-speed rail. And it also has sort of a unique location in the very southern tip of Beijing as uh, a center of, you know, an interface between Beijing and Hebei province. And um, it's not far uh, from Xiong'an either, which is uh, this uh, rather new city in Hebei, which uh, will be uh, the sort of the um, sec- administrative capital of what the Chinese call Jingjinji, which is uh, what they hope will be the progressive merger of uh, the metropolis of Beijing, also the cities of, um, of, of, of Hebei, as well as Tianjin, which, uh, which is a very large coastal city. Um, so yeah, more more space developments in the southern parts of of Beijing, and uh, and yeah, it's definitely something to follow as well. Yeah, and I think that's one thing that um, was very surprising to me the first time that I went to Beijing, and even in subsequent times going back, is that you know you, you imagine Beijing as being one hundred percent this enormous mega city, and, and there is very much a, a mega city inside the Beijing municipality. But uh, even when you get out towards the old, well, the, now the, the older Capital Airport up in the northeast, um, it's pretty rural. And I mean, you, you see around Capital Airport just like country roads and, and you know, people who are basically farmers, uh, you know, 30 kilometers from, from downtown Beijing. And, and I think uh, Daxing, having never been, um, must be even more, let's say, rural than, um, than the area around, uh, is it Shunyi? Is that where the uh, where Capital Airport is, I think? Um, Mm, anyway, uh, so yeah, so I, I guess um, w- one other point to add um, to this this um, this development in, in Daxing is I, I would just point out that this is the uh, the second time in the last few weeks that we've seen a rather remote area of a large city emphasizing space industry development, and in both instances it was taking place uh, near the development of a new and very large airport. And so the other uh, instance of this, which we discussed in the Donghuang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup episode 24 a couple of weeks ago, was Jianyang City in Sichuan province. And so Jianyang is uh, increasingly supportive of commercial space, and we were discussing a couple of weeks ago Galactic Energy and their developments there. Uh, Jianyang is also um, again, it's it's a it's a very rural. Um, I guess it's an, it's not actually part of Chengdu. It is its own city, although it's it's just bordering Chengdu, and it's it's a very rural area of of, uh, of let's say Cheng, Greater Chengdu municipality. Um, but again, it is uh, supporting a, a new uh, sort of space industrial base, and it is also the home of the uh, Chengdu Tianfu Airport, which is expected to open uh, later this year. And uh, this new airport, uh, so again, it is the the second airport of China's probably fifth most populous city, possibly fourth, depending on one's definition. Um, but this this airport is going to be opening with an initial capacity of, of 40 million passengers and an eventual capacity of 80 to 100 million. So it's, it's an enormous airport. And again, you, you can kind of see this um, sort of integrated development of a number of different initiatives in, in these areas that are um, rather far from the very large cities, but that are also potentially... Um, in areas that are, say, in between a city like Chengdu, and I don't know off the top of my head what are the bigger cities to the south, but could be like Yibin or, or other cities in Sichuan. And, and so, again, that would be similar to um, to Xiong'an and to Daxing being sort of near to, um, I guess, Tianjin. And then within Hebei, it would be what, maybe uh, 
Long Fang, I suppose, but that that's my geography gets kind of hazy at that point. But digressing, um, interesting to see that we have a couple of, of space clusters developing near two enormous new airports. And I, I do very much hope that I have the chance to uh, to fly into or out of both Daxing and, and Tianfu airports, uh, you know, in the next year or so. They're both, uh, they, they both look pretty, pretty cool. So um, anything else, John, on, on airports and uh, space industrial bases uh, nearby, or shall we move on to a couple of kind of uh, fast... I'll, I'll uh, throw in a picture of, uh, of Tianfu Airport. It's very cool. It's uh, at the top of a hill. And so you, you have a you have a feeling that the, the runway is in a very precarious situation, but it does look very cool on pictures. I'll put one up in the... <laughs> in the episode. But yeah, turning it, turning it turning it over to you for the Haisa 1 satellite. And just one last fun fact on Tianfu before getting into Haisa 1 is that uh, Tianfu New District in Chengdu is also home to, uh, as far as I know, it is still the world's largest building by square footage, which is the uh, the New World Trade Center or something like that. It, is, it has an indoor beach and it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, so that being said, uh, enough about Tianfu, uh, Tianfu New District, which is a, a place I would recommend checking out. Um, HISA-1. So this is a satellite that was launched, um, I suppose, in December of last year. And uh, it was uh, in the news this week, along with a number of other Earth observation satellites, uh, because of this um, highly, let's call it highly unusual news of uh, of the... the uh, the shipping industry. And so just a quick um, a, a quick kind of disclaimer that Dongfang Hour is not a, a shipping industry podcast and we're not experts on the shipping industry. Um, but again, this is, uh, this, this is interesting news. So we had the, the MV Ever Given uh, operated by Evergreen Marine, which ran aground in, uh, in the Suez Canal in Egypt uh, earlier, I guess, last week. And uh, as of the 28th of March, so today the ship is still stuck, which is blocking traffic in one of the world's busiest uh, canals. Um, and, and just b before really digging into the HISA one part, I, I dug a little bit into the, the Ever Given, and it, it is a pretty incredible ship. So it is 400 meters long, and it's a quarter mile long, basically. Uh, it would take you about five minutes to walk the length of this ship. And so you, you can quite literally uh, see it from space if you have a, a satellite that's looking down. Uh, and, and just one kind of space-related metric, you could stack seven Long March 5 rockets to, you know, end to end on, on this ship, and it would be about that. And that, that's how long 400 meters is. Um, so in short, you know, massive ship. And uh, now getting to the, the space element of the story, and, and um, so the, yeah, yeah, I guess the, the high profile nature of this uh, ship running aground, it was all over the news, and combined with the recent increase in, in SAR and also other Earth observation satellites more generally, it has led to a plethora of online photos from different Earth observation companies. And so we saw you know, Maxar and Capella Space and Airbus and Planet all posting different photos of different angles of this ship run aground. And uh, most probably the newest satellite to capture these images of, of this debacle came from uh, from China with Space City's HISA-1 satellite. Um, so the HISA-1 satellite, as, as I mentioned, we have previously discussed on the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup episode 12 in December last year. Um, it is a new SAR satellite that was developed by Space City in partnership with uh, the Chinese state-owned enterprise CETC, the China Electronics and Technology Group. And um, these images taken by, by the, um, the HISA-1 satellites, again, they, they were posted by, by Spacity across multiple social media platforms in both English and Chinese. And um, I think it's, it's safe to say that it highlighted the fact that Spacity, uh, as a commercial space company, is, is one of China's leaders in having found, um, if not real customers for this satellite, a, a real use for this satellite. They're certainly making uh, you know, good marketing material with, with the HISA-1 satellite. And so I think... Um, I think definitely seeing, again, it was just an interesting kind of uh, thought or an interesting experience to see Capella Space and Planet Labs and all of the kind of leading Western EO companies and then to see Space City's HISA-1 satellite uh, offering some, some really interesting images of this um, highly unusual piece of maritime industry news. So, uh, Jean, anything else from you on, on the maritime element or on the Space City element, or would you like to just get into the next kind of uh, fast piece of news in the week? Well, on the topic of cool pictures, we had the CNSA um, release also two very nice uh, space pictures this week coming from uh, Tian One One spacecraft, notably their medium resolution camera. So it's obviously two pictures of Mars. And so Tian One One, some background here, uh, Tian One One has been in orbit around Mar Mars for maybe about two months now. And it's in a very eccentric orbit, meaning that its closest point to Mars is a few hundred kilometers. Its furthest point is 
uh, 15,000 kilometers. And, um, and it, it has a lot of opportunities to take pictures in the sense that this um, orbit here has a very uh, small rapid um, periodicity, meaning that the spacecraft is able to uh, do an entire revolution around Mars in approximately eight hours. And so um, the two pictures that we see and that uh, I'll obviously put up here in the episode is um, two side shots of Mars from basically 11,000 um, kilometers. And, um, and so what we're seeing here is the northern and southern hemisphere, according to CNSA. So yeah, that's another, another two cool pictures to add uh, beyond HISA 1's shot of the ever given. And that will be about it for me for this week's um, weekly news update. And you know what they say about 11,000 kilometers is that that's roughly equal to 25,000 ever givens. So that's um, not so many ever givens as it would turn out. So I'm sure. That being the case, uh, I don't know how often they actually say that, but let's go with it. This has been another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup for the week of the 22nd to 28th of March. Do be on the lookout in the coming couple of weeks for our latest long form episode, the Dongfang Hour episode eight discussion with the Secure World Foundation and Kalis Foundation on their recent report on US perceptions of Chinese space. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host Jean Deville. Thank you very much for watching or listening and see you next week. Thanks for watching.